Like most of the southeastern United States, Mississippi is a very green state and that plays heavily in our culture and is also a significant industry generating a couple billion dollars in revenue every year. So to protect and manage our natural resources that are a very important part of our way of life and livelihood, we have the Mississippi Forestry Commission, which is a standalone state agency that helps thousands of private landowners every year, protects over 19 million acres of forest land, advises the forestry industry and provides a lot of critical information to them and helps establish best practices. And they also have the urban and community forestry program, which has been expanding. Traditionally, urban and community forestry programs have been about maintaining the health of trees inside urban communities, optimizing how much canopy they have, the right species, health, and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, a very unappealing aspect of any management program is having to deal with disposal. It's simply a fact of life either through development, storm damage, disease, or just age. You know, trees are living things that can get sick and eventually all die and have to be dealt with. And that's almost always a cost to whoever the owner of that tree is to be safely removed, safely hauled away, and then disposed of somewhere, which sadly most of the time is in a landfill. But that's not the only option. So part of the urban and community forestry program that's getting amped up here in Mississippi is finding a way to turn that resource instead of a waste product is actually into a resource. Of course, to all you savvy viewers out there, there seems to be a really obvious answer to the landfill for an e-log and that's, well, mill it up. The problem is often just connecting the dots between all the people that are involved in that process from an arborist to the tree service people to a sawyer, whoever might own a kiln in the area and then the uh, end users, build, uh, builders, or clients. And that's something that the Mississippi Forestry Commission is working on through their urban and community forestry program right now is developing that network of sawyers and kiln owners and craftsmen and communities so that people know that you know there are individuals like me that work with urban material and sawyers like Chad Fletcher at Superior Artisan Wood and Slab who you know will take urban material and then turn it from a waste into an economically productive resource for the community. And that brings us here to this project. The Mississippi Forestry Commission has been building a new state headquarters outside of Jackson, Mississippi. And in that, they want to speak to the work they've been doing. So their co new conference table for the conference room is going to be made out of this urban reclaimed material here. We have some huge sycamore slabs as well as some red oak slabs from Mississippi that were milled by Mississippian Chad Fletcher at Superior Artisan and he dried them and now me a Mississippi craftsman is going to be crafting the table. We also have a reclaimed cypress beam from an old home that's going to be going into the base. Um, it's a really fun project and kudos to the Mississippi Forestry Commission for not just developing this program but also proving the viability of the structure by making it a centerpiece, literally, of their new state headquarters. But anyway, you're not here for some crazy civics lesson. You want to see something get built. So let's start working on this. For me, one of the toughest parts of working on Live Edge projects is establishing my baselines of things that need to be square. For these, all these slabs are coming together in this orientation. So I'm basically going to have three straight lined edges that are all square to each other on all four but I want those live edges to come together. So I'm actually referencing off the live edge, which I pick the straightest side so that way it makes a better desk shape. It's pretty close. And I've marked out my rough chop length on these two slabs. Gonna do one pair at a time. And I recently picked up a laser transit for a bunch of outdoor projects. So I flipped that on its side and I'm using that to project a laser line. And since I know about where I'm gonna cut this off, I'm putting that mark on the line and then the corner on the line of both of these. And that'll give me um, a baseline to then start doing everything else from just using some regular marking tools. Then I'll repeat it on the other side. Um, the footage might not come out great because to see this laser, I'm having to turn all the lights off and work fairly dark, but do my best.
The slabs have developed a little bit of a cup, so to help keep everything flat, I made these C-channels. These were just regular C-channel, then I cut them to my length and drilled some holes for screws, use a pilot hole and then a step bit to open them up. And another note on it is I made the center screw hole really tight. And then as I went out, I made the holes progressively wider to allow for this slab to grow a little bit and not interfere with this. Anyway, time to decrease them and then cut some grooves and install them to flatten them out because I want to flatten them out before I put the epoxy because as I do all the crack filling with that stuff, I think that's going to help it hold its shape better. These two slabs have quite a bit of cracking down the middle and I could, well, I guess it was that one actually. I could flatten out by hand pretty easy. So I thought the metal would be strong enough to do it, but the metal is actually just bending to the contour. But anyway, I've been prepared for this because I know on the red oak, it's definitely gonna need some help flattening out. So what I'm gonna do is just run a few score lines partially through with a track saw and that'll weaken the wood to uh, give me some flex. Six more are all done. I'll show you the full process on the red oak. Here's what I've learned. And it's probably worth mentioning why I'm taking this approach anyway, because these aren't laminations, they're not as stable. Since it's a single slab, they're going to keep moving over time. So instead of just milling them flat, not that my machines are big enough, which is one of the reasons I'm doing this and I don't want to do a router sled. That's the other way is they're probably going to keep moving. So I'd rather future proof this. So what I did is end up having to make more cuts a lot deeper than I anticipated to get it to move the way I wanted to. So I guess I can understand how my X felt now. But yeah, I left about a half inch of material, which is still pretty strong, really. But now the metal, instead of trying to move the wood, is really just making up for all the strength I took out to make sure. So when like cranks down on the very edge of this, that metal is backing where there isn't as much wood to keep everything sturdy. Um, I used a router to cut out these grooves for the metal. And since I'm gonna have to fill these cracks and some of the kerf lines overlap, with the cracks in the wood that I'm gonna epoxy fill, I bedded those cracks before I set the metal in with silicone. Need to go back and do that on those. And also since I'm mostly concerned with having everything flat in the middle where they meet, on that one I did the two ends, but on this one I did the end and the middle. And I think on the oak, I'm gonna continue that, do the end and the middle to move more of the strength towards uh, the, the middle of the joints where I need the strength. So anyways, let's jump to the red oak. Sealed up the bottom the best I could with the Bondo and silicone. I feel like I did a pretty good job. Now I've got some high performance two to one. This is a thicker epoxy and I'm using a fast setting hardener. This has a 10 minute um, gel time, very quick pot life. And I'm going to do a thin pour just to make sure if there are any leaks, this is gonna gel up and block those quickly. So then it's safe to pour the uh, thinner stuff that takes a lot longer to set that I'm gonna fill everything with intent. Cause if I just went straight to that pour and I had a leak, it would just leak and leak and leak and leak and leak for days, whereas this is going to set up quick. The two to one high performance epoxy has had plenty of time to dry and all my little drips are dry and there are zero leaks. So I think the caulk and Bondo worked well. So definitely gonna keep that in my pocket. Of course, we'll find out for sure when we pour this much watery stuff. And the reason I'm using two different epoxies is of course the fast set to help seal everything, but this is going to flow a lot better. If you've ever tried to use a thick epoxy to do crack filling like this, you'll notice you have to like babysit it and keep adding and adding and adding because it slowly works and then you have to put some more and you gotta put some more. It takes forever. This stuff flows a lot better so I can eliminate that. I can just do one pour, come check on it in a little bit. There's a long enough pot life. I won't have to mix more. I'll have some I can top off with and probably be good. So that's why I like using this stuff on anything thin 
And also some of these voids are just big enough that it'd probably have issues with the uh, other stuff going exothermic, whereas the thick set's gonna be just fine. So anyway, time to just make sure I mix this thoroughly. Probably one of the biggest mistakes with epoxy, probably to the two biggest, is not doing the right uh, ratio and then not mixing thoroughly enough. Because if it's not mixed, it just doesn't cure. So yeah, let's do that. And once I get it fully mixed, I'll add some pigment. I'm using the Total Boat Pigment Dispersion, which is the best product for opaque colors I've ever used, especially um, they have a whole range of colors and you can mix them, but like reds and blues and yellows, like the vibrant rich colors, richest reds uh, I've ever been able to get from opaque epoxy. So if you, uh, yeah, it's a good product. <laughs> My trick for that is to just use some Starbond CA glue and I really like the black because I'm using black and some accelerator with these little tips and get it right on the air hole, hit it with some accelerator, cures instantly and boom, ready to move on. After the hand planer, I used my big gym sander with 40 grit paper to get everything rough sanded, then came back with some 60 grit on my Merca. I was also chasing the pinholes with that Starbond CA glue. Have everything in a good place, time to do the finish sanding. Did all the rough sanding off camera and was gonna do the rest of it because who likes to see sanding? But it is a very important part of the process, so should probably show it. And I'm going to do my best to use interpretive cinematography to show you how I feel about it. Obviously these are huge, so for delivery sake, I just wanna carry one slab at a time, which means we have to be able to join them on site. I'm using the domino connector system to make that happen. As you can see, we have some regular dom dominoes set in here, but we also have this other set of holes that use this connector system, which is three pieces, kind of like your Ikea furniture, where this piece drops in here, this goes in there, and that helps pull everything together and lock it in place. I glued these dominoes in just one side and then we'll put them in the other because you can notice that this has a little bit of slop. It's not near as tight, so it needs the reinforcement. Now, all these are not quite centered because we're gonna have to do some finessing to get everything to match, but this corner is where the badge is gonna go. And when I route the pocket for that logo, I don't want to route into these dominoes, so I put these even closer to the bottom to give me more allowance for that. So basically we have one, two, three different, uh, actually four, four different domino settings going on putting this together. So it's definitely a coffee and Wheaties kind of morning to not mess this up, but fingers crossed I haven't messed up any yet, except for the one you can't see. beam is not straight flat or anything and bigger in spaces than the square in the base that it has to go through. So I had to do these notches and they had to be square and all in line uh, to fit the base. And it was so like, how do I do this that I forgot to record at all? So let me show you kind of what I ended up doing. So the first thing was to get a reference surface, which was the top of all these. So I used my laser transit and got them all in line 
with the laser and then used a level. To sit on here, I used level as my other reference to make sure that they were all level this way because the laser made sure they were in line that way. Now I had one flat plane. Then I found the center of the beam on each end and ran a taut string line. This It's a little loose now, but it was tight. And then I used my little square and would just barely bump up against it and mark each edge. And then I would know, you know, to get the width I need. And then as I was working, I just use a big framing square to make sure this face was square with the other face. Same thing on the other side, all the way down. And this right here is what I used to do all the cutting. Felt like a real woodworker. And then to do the last face, it was the easiest. I just measured down from the top to where it needed to be on each side and connected the lines. Also using the square to make sure that, you know, the bottom was square to each side, keeping everything pretty square. And that's how I made work. So that big random beam is gonna fit in this box. This plate unbolts, the only thing left is to drill a hole for that dude. One of the focal points of this table is going to be their logo right in the middle, but I have all the four slabs meeting there, which introduces a lot of problems. So to solve all those, I'm just going to turn their badge into a badge that'll drop in there. It's super important that this is very flat. So you saw I milled it, I've let it rest a few days, I didn't bring it down to final dimension. In fact, I don't even have a specific dimension I have to hit. But the reason for that is because this was fairly defective, I knew it was gonna move again, and big surprise, it did. I'll bring you in close so you can see, but yeah, this is not, not flat. So we're gonna mill it again and bring it to flat. The panel I made for the logo badge is Brad nailed down to my spool board and I ginned up some tool paths for my robot because I want this to be perfect and this is a lot more perfect than I am. So time to hit go and let this bad boy do all the work. <laughs> 